What's going on you guys? Welcome back to my channel. I haven't done a sit down in a minute and so today is going to be a little different. I'm actually going to sit down and talk all about collegiate golf. If you are a future collegiate golfer in the making, you're thinking about college golf, you're a female that wants to go into college golf, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about my story, the process to getting recruited, what it's like to be a D1 or a collegiate golfer, and we'll see if that if that fits for you and if that's if that's your journey and hopefully this video helps you. So here we go. All right, you guys. So I feel like there's a lot of information that could be covered in a video like this. So I was I'm hoping that I'm gonna be able to do it justice. I haven't even looked to see if there's any other videos such as this. So I'm just going to somewhat wing it. I have a bit of a of a template here and we're gonna go from there. So I'm gonna start with my collegiate story. So for those of you who don't know, I committed to Cal State Fullerton and mind you, I'm a little rusty because collegiate golf is now, oh God, what is that? Is it seven years ago? Seven years ago? Is it seven years ago now? Oh my gosh. Wow, I just shocked myself because I, I in some ways I feel like it was yesterday and in some ways, well, I can't remember the recruiting process entirely. I had to freshen up. Anyway, so it, it's been it's been um, over five years, you guys, okay? So I played my four years at Cal State Fullerton. I went to a little high school in Marietta, signed my NLI, my National Letter of Intent there to go there. And I was in between Cal State Fullerton. I was also in between uh, Baylor University in Texas, uh, UC Davis, Cal State Long Beach, and uh, there was a lot of other schools in the mix. Like I was also looking at Northwestern and, and a few others, uh, a lot of state colleges. But then um, in the end, I didn't want to be far from California, coming from live, being born in Illinois, being raised in Illinois, and then seeing what it's like to be able to train all year round. I knew I didn't want to be in a place where I couldn't train all year round. So California, I knew in the end was for me. Anyways, my story is I, I committed to Cal State. Um, it really came down to the wire. I did an unofficial visit to Baylor University, which was awesome. Uh, there's not a lot in Waco, Texas. It's very much a university kind of town. Uh, but for me, it just, it wasn't for me. I think people can probably tell by just my personality that it wasn't for me, but I was very impressed by what they had. They had, a, they had an amazing facility. And then it narrowed down to the three California colleges. Um, UCR was very, very interested in me as well but I had a full ride scholarship opportunity um, for Cal State Fullerton, Cal State Long Beach, UC Riverside, and then UC Davis had, oh gosh, I think it was like a 50% or 75% scholarship, something of that nature. But I knew that at UC Davis, I wouldn't be starting. I wouldn't be a starting player or I wouldn't be a number one player. And that to me was very, very important because I wanted to be a ring leader of a team versus barely making the travel team. And so that was my biggest battle with UC Davis. But at the time, I don't know the current ranking right now, but UC Davis was top of the pack. They were top 20 in the nation or at times top 10 in the nation. They won Big West. I, majority of the years from what I recall, um, they were just so, such a solid team. Uh, from the very beginning of my, of my high school years, to me finishing up college golf. They were just the top, always the top. So I, I had the opportunity to go there. So funny that I was dancing around the Big West Conference, which is the Cal States plus UC Davis in the mix conference. So ended up going to um, Cal State Fullerton for a few reasons. I went there because I, I knew coming into college that I wanted to be a communications major and that really fit me. They have a very good uh, communications program and I was able to visit and check that out. And also I got to see the facilities and the courses that we practice at for California College Golf. It's a little different, there isn't a lot of basically land for a college university to be able to have their own practice facility. Like if you go to um, like Washington University, they have their own golf course. New Mexico, they have their own golf course. Texas, Baylor, they have their own indoor facility. Northwestern, Illinois, they have their own indoor facility. But in California, there's just not that much opportunity like that. 
and there's no need for an indoor facility because we have um, you know good weather relatively all year round so for a lot of collegiate golfers in California both men and women you will have to drive to your golf course or tag along with your teammate to your course so for me that didn't deter me still since that's always how I practice, just you know, kind of running around from course to course. And we had access to, I think, six to seven different courses, which was awesome. But in the end, what really, really um, took it home for me was the collegiate coach at the time, who was Pearl Sin, one of the first LPGA, one of the first Korean LPGA players on tour. Her um, her name now is Pearl Sin Bunani. And she she's amazing. She's still uh, someone I consider close to me today. And she was actually a new coach at that moment. And not too long after she ended up uh, retiring after, after my period of doing my time at Cal State Fullerton, but she was amazing. She was just someone that I had really uh, clicked with. Our, our personalities clicked. I, I loved the way she trained and I knew that I wanted to go professional at the end of it all. And that who better to coach me than someone who was right there, to one of the, one of the best junior golfers in the world for some time and then followed by a top LPGA player for some time. So that's why I went to Cal State and and that was that was that was my journey. And it was definitely um, you know, a lot of, of not what I expected, uh, but I made, you know, lifelong friendships along the way. I was able to be a drive or just, you know, uh, an hour drive or so from home and and, and it was it was great. It was definitely a huge learning experience. And although a lot of college golfers choose to turn pro before they even go to college, or they you know they cut their their collegiate term short and then they decide to commit to college, um, for me I thought it was really really important for me to finish those four years not only for my education um, and getting that experience of communications under my belt since I knew that I wanted that to be my fallback, but also it gave me more experience with competitive play and good team play and even though it's an individual sport I just learned so much about getting along with other players uh, seeing what the competition is out there because the majority of the people you see in college are who you're going to compete with professionally and that was really big for me so I was able to size up my competition a lot as soon as I turned pro I knew I knew what kind of game I was looking at uh, out the gate so yeah so we're gonna dive into my my college golf story more a little later in my experiences, but I wanted to go through now um, how to get into college golf. All right, so this applies to both men and women's golf, but obviously I can speak a lot more strongly to women's golf and, and also my timelines may be a bit different because I know that a lot of rules have changed, but I'm hoping that this video can help some of you guys because I really wish I had this video for myself back when I was a sophomore, freshman, sophomore, junior in high school. So um, how to get into co college golf if you're looking into it. Firstly, you want to be a competitive and or nationally ranked golfer uh, competing in nationwide events or statewide events. Um, for me being in California, those associations that I was a part of or organizations that I competed for, I competed in USGA events, a bunch of USGA qualifiers, those are big ones that recruiters are always at. AJGA events are also nationwide. Um, the American Junior Golf Association is probably one of the most like elite golf junior organizations. That's where you see a ton of pros come from. Recruiters will naturally go there for rankings and to also find players. AJGA events were where recruiters were looking at me most, that's for sure. And then um, in California, in Southern California, there is a few organizations still around called SCPGA, uh, which is Southern California Professional Golf Association, I think. And then um, SD, JGA, which is the San Diego Junior Golf Association. Um, oh, Junior Golf Association, sorry. Anyways, you see, there's a lot of acronyms here. So there's there's a lot of competitive golf that you wanna that you wanna make sure you have, and you want to have this competitive golf and and all these tournaments and hopefully good scores under your belt so that you can build a resume for yourself. Now, you're saying maybe you're like a freshman in high school and you're saying, I'm thinking about collegiate golf. Well, I won't say that that's too late because you still have time to build a resume and go out and compete if you actually really, really mean it. I actually, my teammate back in college was um, Taylor Fowler, 
who uh, was also is also from my hometown, and Ricky Fowler's um, younger sister. She's a couple years older than me. She very different. She obviously it's a very very talented individual. She actually somehow she got recruited her junior year of high school, which is rare. You get recruited a little sooner. College coaches already know the players they want at this rate, and they already are watching players coming into high school because the talent just keeps getting younger and younger. Taylor Fowler at the time, she actually got recruited out of her junior year, I believe, of high school. Didn't really have much competitive background outside of high school golf, but she was posting such good numbers in high school golf um, and has connections, and she was just, she she was a softball player who got injured and was starting to she was breaking 40 on nine hole matches just you know left and right and then shooting good scores on 18 hole high school matches and then played in a few tournaments um local tournaments and she played well when it really mattered and caught the eye of a new organization being cal state fullerton because we were reinstated um the year a year or two before i came in and then she was granted a scholarship at Cal State Fullerton and eventually got a full ride. So, and there's some scenarios where, you know, it's quite possible to, to make it a little later in the game and get recruited later. But my point is, is if you really want to look into collegiate golf, hopefully if you're watching this, you've already have competed and <clears throat> you've kind of put your, you know, put your foot in the water there and, you know, competing in whatever event and then you 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 maintain that that momentum and, and build good scores so the more good scores you have to put on a resume that you will build for yourself or you could hire someone to do that but i made my resume myself um like the more the better and so if you want to get into collegiate golf be sure that you're a competitive golfer um, highly recommend being a competitive golfer outside of high school golf and i mean the majority of Golfers that do go on to play in collegiate golf have been playing golf for quite a long time. I started when I was three. I started competing competing at seven. And a lot of players I know started kind of competing around that 13, 14, 12, 13, 14 year old age, which I think is kind of like a good, a good number, a good age number to kind of get started. Um, and and yeah, so so look into those those golf organizations if you haven't already look up the tournaments sign up get out there play i know it's scary at first but once you kind of get into it you can make a lot of friends and you kind of can get into the group of things and get used to that pressure which i think is really really important next thing you want to have if you're going into collegiate golf is grades your grades they do matter um i think I think some websites have been saying that your grades are more important than your golf. I'm just here to like give you guys the honest, honest, and I think it just depends. From experience, the better golf golfer you are, the more lenient uh, the school or the coaches have been in your in grades. That's coming off experience, okay? Like whatever, someone can slap me on the wrist for saying, "Oh, you can get away with bad grades," whatever. Um, but you know, I have a little time in like in football, they fail, but then they can still get a scholarship. So, but obviously you want to have a good balance. I think you need above a 2.5, 2.3 GPA average coming out of high school, which really, come on, you guys, you can do this. You can do this. That's just, you just got to attend class. That's, that's easy. Um, turn in your homework. That's, that's all. There's going to be a lot harder pressures in life. I promise you. Oh, SATs. Um, you have to take your SATs and ACTs. They took in my SATs. Luckily for Cal State Fullerton, they had very low recommendation for it and I didn't have to retake mine. But when I was considering Northwestern University, they had a very All right. I got cut off there probably because my phone wants to die already. What I was saying was, is that, um, in terms of, uh, ACTs, SATs, when I was looking at Northwestern U University, they actually had very high recommendation. And that was one of the things that it was, it was hard for me to, to meet that requirement. I was never a good test taker. So you guys have to keep that in mind. And so maintaining your grades, getting those um, ACTs and SAT scores up or at a decent place. And the reason why grades are also important is because coaches, what they look for is making sure that you're a player that's going to maintain eligibility. And they don't want you to become a liability because they don't want to hope for you as a player to just, you know, maintain 
that ability, but then if, if you cannot surpass the minimum requirements of just being a good student and keeping up with your academics, then you're, you are suddenly not a reliable player for your team. And so at least that's, that's my understanding um, from, a, from a coach's perspective. So grades are important, game is important, but I won't say that I won't say that grades are more important because your ability is really what attracts them first. So get that ability, get that experience and make sure your grades are solid and right there. You can manage both. So let's let's talk um, scoring averages. So for, for men's golf, I think this may be a little different, so don't take my quote on it. Um, but going off experience for me, for women's golf, if you, I was a, I was a D1 player and Cal State Fullerton at my time, at its best, we were, I think at our best, we touched like 50th or top 50. Um, but on average for our four years, we were around like ranked 75th around that time. That was, I remember that was kind of like that sweet spot number, which is really not too bad in the grand scheme of things. Um, and, and so average scores, so what they say is for D1 athletics, for 18 holes, if you want to be like a pure solid recruit, if you're averaging even or better, you're good, you're gone. You're obviously on a path of, you know, you're probably going to want to go professional or something of that route if you are that young and averaging even or better. Um, and, and if you are just looking to become a solid D1 player, I would say, a good sweet spot number is to be averaging around 75. You'll be making a D1 university. You may be the, you know, you may be the tail end. You may be the leader. It depends on the university that you go to. Um, they say that D2, that you have, you average around like maybe 75 to 78 or 78 and better. D3 or NAIA could be low 80s. I think you can even be able to get, get onto a collegiate team there. Um, averaging like an 81 and below, I'd say. And just know that from, from at least my experience that scholarship opportunities happen the most through D1 and D2 and the more, and whenever I've, I've received D3 or NAIA offers, they were never like for a full ride scholarship or anything of that nature. It was, um, it was just kind of like a, a little bit of aid, a little bit of athletic help. And, and like I said, for me, I knew I wanted to go professional. So, so that what, that's why D1 was most important for me. Oh, and then I guess for myself, when I was coming out of high school, I think my average was right around 75. And then I had a few really good finishes at the end of high school that I think um, brought my average like touching 74. Um, and, and I also won, like I won my, my league, my, my league, high school league and stuff like that. And I was still playing and, SCPGA events, AJGA events, um, that was always the grind is that golf is very all year round. And so even when I'm not in school, I am now playing these outside tournaments. And even on the weekends, I'm playing in tournaments uh, when then I have I have school on the weekdays. So it's, it's definitely a grind in that manner. However, to know, at least from the last statistic I, I read, which was, I probably should actually check on this, but for a while at least, Collegiate women's golf has been known to be the most feasible collegiate um, collegiate scholarship that you can receive. And college women's golf actually offers the most scholarship in, in correlation to number of players per team, right? Like obviously on a soccer team, there's more, more women, um, but on a college women's golf team, I think men's team too, you will average around, I think, you can see teams with seven people, which is very little, but I've also seen teams with about upwards of 14 individuals, but obviously not everyone there has full ride scholarships. Each university is limited to the amount of full scholarships they give, or they're given all scholarships. Um, like they'll say like, okay, here's five full scholarships. Now do what you do with it. I think that is actually, I think that each team I can verify. Okay, well, I don't have it here at this moment. I'm pretty sure it each university is um, for at least D1 women's golf, they are given five full scholarships and you divvy it up how you please. So on my team, it was like I had a full scholarship, another girl had a full scholarship, and then the other three were divvied up. And then we try and raise it every single year. So that's that. Now, okay, 
Now in terms of timing, I'm going to have to look at my notes for this one because this I, I don't want to mess this up for anyone who's actually relying on me for like the 1,000 views I may get. Um, so for timing, so I, I just looked this up. So dates were actually a little different during my time than now, so I'm glad that I looked it up. But here it says, um, so coaches, coaches are, are allowed to reach out to you after your sophomore year, specifically June 15th after your sophomore year. You're allowed to have contact. That could be um, an email, a hello, uh, yeah, any, any form of contact. Um, and like literally the word contact is a very important word in, in, co in college recruiting. Like there's, there, it's very specific. Um, and then, yeah, so it says here specifically June 15th after their sophomore year, according to NCAA's uh, coach, coaches. Um, they may call you after June 15th and calls are unlimited. Um, off campus contact is allowed beginning August 1st before your junior year and official visits are, are also available beginning August 1st before your junior year. Um, so hopefully you guys got that. And the difference between an official visit and an unofficial visit, an official visit is when you are being actively recruited by a school and they are covering all your costs to go and visit that school. They may cover your family as well. They may give you some tickets to a sporting event at their school and they give you a tour and it's like the whole shebang. They're basically taking you on a very nice date. And I will say official visits are very nice. Um, I think I actually, I had a few official visit offers, but I took two official visits, obviously one to Cal State Fullerton, <clears throat> one to Cal State Long Beach. Oh, I also did one to UC Davis. And I did an unofficial to Baylor University. I did an unofficial and official to UC Davis because at first I really, really wanted to go there. And then, um, and then something just kind of told me that that wasn't the place for me. And that was also NorCal a bit far and, um, the coach at the time, I didn't have that same connection with that coach compared to the Cal State Fullerton coach during my time to Pearl. Okay, so I explained what an official visit is. So now that you know what an official visit is, an unofficial visit, you can actually have as many, I think, unofficial visits as you, excuse me, bubble water. I'm, a, I'm like a bubble water, um, like fanatic now i don't know how this started happening but it's a great tactic if you just want to get full fast <clears throat> anyways so for unofficial visits i believe you can have as many as you want but if you are having an unofficial visit before august 1st of your junior year you are not allowed to meet up with the coaches and or you know arrange a tour with them and have contact like it's very strict with those rules and if you break those rules it can really hinder your your chances of getting into that school so um so if it's if it's at august 1st after august 1st of your junior year then you may have an unofficial visit visit with as many schools as you want the difference is that you are covering it out of your own pocket i recommend that if you're going on an official visit to a school you might as well go see the other schools that are kind of around that area that are like drivable paths to kind of you know you know knock out two birds with one stone kind of thing. And you wanna make sure that you're seeing as much as you can because for an official visit, you can only have an official visit once with a university and you can only have a five max official visits at all. So choose wisely. Now, lastly, um, what to expect? What to expect? So it's funny because I think that <clears throat> college recruiting, and I've seen it on both ends because I'm still good friends with the, now the current college coach of Cal State Fullerton, who was my teammate uh, back in the day. And it, it's it's funny because college coaching and, and player recruitment, it's like dating, essentially. And you're, you're it's like kind of like The Bachelor in some weird way. It's like, it was weird. I'm such a very like loyal person, I feel like. And so for me to be like, 
talking to a coach, going on an official visit, and then, you know, I'm saying all the right things, they're saying all the right things, like, we want you, you know, you're our player, you're gonna be starting, this and that, and then you go to another official visit, and then suddenly you're there like, you know, you're it, you're who I want, you're our number one prospect, and you're like, yeah, yeah, and you're like, ah, oh, I feel like I'm cheating, like, that's kind of what it feels like, um, and that's the best case scenario if, if you're being sought after, for me, I was always that player that was kind of in the middle. I was being sought after, but I was also chasing at the same time. And then for the elite players, they just had, they're like, oh, I got a letter from Northwestern. I got a letter from Stanford. I got a letter from UCLA, USC, all that. And, and you know, for to those who are getting recruited by them, that's, that's awesome. You guys probably have a little bit less preparation because your game is speaking louder than words in itself. So for those who are really kind of in the same place that I was, that like, you know you have the ability, but you have a little more to prove. You have to create your own resume. Um, a Kind of like a video reel was was what I had to create, but I think social media kind of, kind of speaks for that now, which you guys should also be very careful about your social media because social media can be the best thing ever. As you know, that's my job, I love it. But it can also be something that shoots you in the foot when it comes to college recruiting and jobs in the future, but college recruiting especially. But you know, posting your swings um, or creating a video for the coaches for them to see because you know, for me, my college coach actually really liked where my swing was heading. And there were moments in my recruiting process where I super messed up. I think I shot like a 90 one time in, in the middle of my recruiting process, which was just, it was just terrifying. It was like, I had the, I had the yips and whatnot. And, um, and she still really, really loved everything I was doing, not only because of my where my swing was heading, but she loved my work ethic. So there's a lot of things that coaches look at. Uh, college recruiting is seriously like dating. So so be very so be very specific for the things that you want. Um, things to look out for when you are actually on your visits. Um, be mindful of what kind of major that you want to take. And if you don't know, then you don't know. Then you know, maybe that'll free up your options. But for me. I knew I had to go to a school that had a good communications program and, and I felt like Cal State Fullerton stood out more to me than Long Beach and even actually more to me than UC Davis even though they said they had a great program but when I visited the building and whatnot I didn't feel like it had the best. I felt like Cal State Fullerton um, had the best for me. Uh, also too, if you guys have, if you guys know some of the teammates, reach out, talk to them about it. Um, if you know friends that are going to that university, it doesn't have to be an athlete, ask them about it. Ask them about the environment because where you end up going, especially if it's not local, you don't have home to run away to anymore. This will now be your home for the next four or five years and you may decide to live there. So make sure that you not only like the people you're around, Maybe reach out to those teammates, or if you know those teammates, fantastic. Um, but just kind of check out the area, the city in itself to make sure that, that it suits you. Like for me, Waco, Texas was not for me. I didn't I really truly didn't know what I was gonna do outside of practice, even though I was like a workaholic. And, and so your dynamic with your teammates are gonna be pretty important because in golf, I think opposed to a lot of sports, you spend so much time with them. Like literally training can be, you know, you go play a round of golf and then you decide to go train a little bit after and then you may do a fun little putting game. You can be spending sometimes eight hours with these people in a day. And then when you travel, you're gone for three, four, or I think four to five days for a golf tournament and you're rooming with them. So teammates you want to get along with and, um, you know, check out the check out that coach do you get along with that coach do you see eye to eye do you see eye to eye with their coaching ability okay because i wish there here's a few things that i wish that i i knew before walking into college golf or collegiate sports in general especially in an individual sport is that any college coach that tells you that there is no drama on a golf on a team there's drama on a team okay that's just like flat out it like especially if you're on a women's golf team there is bound to be issues whatever that is um someone's bound to mess up and someone's gonna get the heat for it someone's bound to fight with another person you're bound to fight with your coach i definitely fought with my coach multiple times and i still love her but there have been falling outs as well um between coaches and other players and that truly affects your game and if you're looking for longevity of your sport, especially if you want to play beyond college, 
make sure you're choosing a coach that is well suited for you because I personally went through a lot of issues between my college coach and my swing coach. Usually players have a swing coach on top of their college coach and I was definitely being dictated two different methods and I couldn't I couldn't perform at my peak and that really sucked because I felt like I had way more to offer in college golf than than I did. So so you guys just be ready for it. Be fully aware of the people you're going to be around because you're bound to argue, you're bound to fight, but you guys are also going to be sisters and your coach is gonna be basically like your mom or your dad, if they're a guy. Um, so make sure that you love everything that you see, really. Um, what else? In college golf, it's different because it is an individual sport, right? And if you guys aren't aware of how it kind of goes, let's say if you have a team of 10 to 15 girls, Normally only five girls travel. And what do you have to do? It's a tournament within a tournament every single week. When, as soon as you get to college, you get to practicing as a team and then you go through qualifying together. And when you're on a team, you qualify and you depends on the coach. They'll say like, okay, we have a two day qualifier, four day qualifier, what have you. And, and basically you try and beat your teammates out to be able to travel to the next event. And then usually coaches will get a coach's pick or two coaches picks. Um, fortunately for me, I think I, qual I qualified every single time um, and, and I didn't have to rely on coach's pick, which is, which is good, although I think I would have been. Um, and, and yeah, and sometimes it gets hard because sometimes, if you're, especially if you're rooming with a teammate who may not always make qualifying, it can get weird. And that's just kind of like the honesty of it, but it's just kind of the nature of the game and you guys learn to get along and, and you know root for each other along the way. For me personally, I, you know, I, like I said, I knew I wanted to go professional, but I think I took everything so seriously back in college. And I, and I wish someone told me to just let loose. Like I never went out to a college party really. I never really drank. I never did any of those. I mean, I'm not encouraging you guys to do those things. That's terrible. But I'm saying that while you're in college, as much as, as much as I know that you guys probably want to grind and do your thing, live your life because this is your time to really learn, develop, meet new people, um, and just kind of grow, grow as a person. And for me, I was very sheltered for as, as open and, and you know, uh, as charismatic I, as I am, I wasn't that. I was such a, I'm gonna wake up, 6 a.m., train, practice, grind, after team practice, individual practice, study, do it again, do it again. And it really bore me down to the ground. I was very much like a, a train till I die kind of person. I felt like golf to me became life or death that even my coaches were telling me like, you need to relax. And and I wish that, that I was able to do that and I would get really upset and resentful towards my teammates who would go out and party and do whatever and then wake up hungover and they'd get on practice and they would still beat me in a qualifier and it just frustrated me cause, and it was really, I put too much pressure on myself. So I'm telling you guys that you know, as, as stressful as the process can be of recruitment and trying to find that right college. Like this is all a very enjoyable time. All of it should also be fun. Embrace every piece of it. And once you get to college, embrace those moments with your teammates. Um, em embrace, embrace the hard qualifying, embrace the training sessions. I can't tell you how many times like for us at my school, if someone was late to practice, we had to do sprints and or stadiums and that was the worst. Stadium runs on 100 degree concrete or more. Yeah, there's been a few times where my, me and my teammates would throw up because it was just hardcore training. Oh, that too. Training, you guys. Training is hard. Um, if you are not used to working out, you will get used to working out very, very fast in college golf. Um, and that, and be very mindful of what can lead you to injury. Soreness can really affect your game, making sure that it's tailored to you and that you're training the right way. But if, you, if you're not used to working out, you will be used to working out because training is usually three days a week or more. And a lot of universities incorporate heavy lifting, especially in the off season so that you guys can bulk and then build muscle and then maintain in in the season. But um, yeah, I would recommend getting, getting a head start on that because for me, my first day of training, I was so sore that on my first tee shot of qualifying, I literally whiffed the ball, I topped it because my triceps were so sore, I couldn't lift my club up. 
that I literally missed the ball and the ball just dribbled sideways and didn't even get past the forward tees. And my college coach literally said, what the F <laughs> in, front, in front of all of us. It was kind of a laughing moment, like freshman who was supposed to be number one, just whiffed her shot in industry hills, but you know, whatever. So, I mean, I think that's basically it. I, I hope I covered enough for you guys. Um, if you guys have any more questions, please let me know. Uh, for my usual viewers, this is a very different video. This is definitely catered to um, the younger audience who is looking to get into college golf. Um, for those of you who are maybe not golfers all your life or whatever, uh, know that it is very possible to still get into college golf. Uh, walk-ons are still a thing, but are not available to every single university. If you don't know what a walk-on is, it's essentially where you already, uh, intend to attend that university and you'd like to walk on to that team and if you do your research if you contact the coach check out if there's an open spot on the roster like it's not a full house and have a resume a video and all that stuff ready it's definitely possible one of my closest friends walked on to ucla and eventually made travel team by junior year and she was playing alongside the players like tiffany joe ryan o'toole sydney michaels and all those girls that you see now on tour so totally, totally doable. Um, and you know, whether or not you decide to pursue college golf outside of, um, wait, whether or not you decide to pursue professional golf outside of college when you're all done, just know that that college athletic experience is one that I think is so, it's just like a, a time of your life you'll never forget, right? Like when you're the athlete at a university, you're kind of like a superhero in your own way, wearing your team gear, matching all the time, you're representing your school. It's it's like a mini Olympics. I say that because the Olympics are on right now, but it kind of feels like that. It makes you feel it makes you feel like someone, you know? And uh, and it's something that it's it's like a responsibility and and um and it's and it should be fun. Um also to know I know that it's all very new, but I very much realize that endorsements are now being allowed for NCAA athletes. I don't really know of any golfers yet who are um, who are being offered any insane amounts, but know that that is an awesome opportunity and that having your name, image, and likeliness being able to benefit <clears throat> and, and hopefully make money off of that is huge. And so for, for that, take advantage of that and, and be mindful again of what you put out there because if it's out there on the internet, you believe me, <laughs> once it's out there, you can't take it back. Take it from me. Um, but you you know use that kind of stuff to your advantage because that can really set you up for for after um, for after college and um, what else oh but at the end of the day know that even though that that's now a thing what's gonna get you those endorsements and all this whatnot is is your ability so make sure that your ability will always come first and i would say that i mean i i, I intend to do a video for those who are looking to turn professional. And I would say the same thing in that video, let your ability speak louder than everything else. Because for me, when branding became important to me and I did it all myself, and it's a really hard thing to do by yourself, that's when my game started to suffer. And you, you have to have all your eggs in that basket when it comes to playing professionally or, or choosing that sport. So focus on that ability and you're gonna get there. You're gonna have a good time. So I hope this video has helped some of you out. If any of you guys are looking for more information on college recruitment and or if I missed a question or or what have you, you can head to ncaa.org, eligibilitycenter.org, and or usga.org where I'm sure a lot of your questions are going to be answered there. Um, of course, you guys can always message me, comment down below, DM me, what have you. I usually see those new messages. I'm happy to answer, especially for those who are, who are really looking into collegiate golf. Um, I'm here to help. And that's basically it. I hope you all enjoyed this sit down video and, and, and my story. And I hope that this encourages you to want to find that right school because all of it matters down to the coach, down to your team, down to the courses, down to the environment, down to the city. It's gonna be your home for the next few years. And so you want to love it and, and just kind of take it all in. So if you like what you see, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notifications button so you don't miss a beat. Bye for now, you guys.